My name is Erin Garrett, and I'm an Energy and Environmental Stewardship Educator for University of Illinois Extension. Before we get started today, we're going to go over a few reminders. Um, so these sessions are being recorded. Um, so because of that, we ask that you please turn your videos off. Uh, I'm going to have mine on just as I do my introduction, and I'll turn mine off as well. Um, and um, I believe we disabled where, where you can unmute yourself so you don't have to worry about that, but stay muted and please turn your video off. If you're not able to figure out how to do that, uh, my co-host Nancy can go ahead and turn your video off for you. Um, these recordings will be shared to University of Illinois Extension's YouTube page. Um, please be patient and allow us a few weeks to process and upload these videos. Um, with closed captioning um, requirements and the specific content of these webinars and all of the terminology, it does take a little bit of time um, to get those closed captioned properly and uploaded. So please be patient with us. And since you all registered, you'll be receiving an email once those videos are available and uploaded. So um, we will let you know when they are available for you to rewatch and share. Um, if you have a question, at any time during the course of the presentation, please feel free to type it into the chat box. And my co-host, Nancy, she's gonna be moderating that chat um, and gathering those questions up so that we can get as many as we can answered at the end of the presentation today. Um, at the end of this week, we will have an evaluation for you to fill out and we'll be sharing that on Friday after that session and emailing it to you if you're not able to make it on that Friday session. And hi, everybody. I'm Nancy Kahida, helping Erin out today as moderator. And I just threw my email into the chat if anyone needs it, or certainly you can privately uh, message me as well if you have any issues. Great. Thank you so much, Nancy. All right. So if today is your first day joining us, welcome. Um, and if you are unable to join us on Monday, we're going to start today with an overview um, of the basics of grass identification. So if you were here on Monday, it's always good to refresh. Um, and then we're going to move into identifying prairie grasses today. And then Friday, if you're able to join us, we're going to be covering nuisance grass identification. All right. So as we get started today, as I mentioned on Monday, most of my grass identification knowledge is self-taught and based on practical field experiences. And this is the approach that I decided to apply to this grass identification series is to keep things simple and provide you with practical characteristics that you can look for on grasses to easily identify them. In the emails um, with information for these webinars, I included a link um, to a grass identification resource that I have been working on developing. Um, in today's, this morning's reminder email, I sent a slightly different link that should automatically download that PDF for you if you are having some difficulties getting it to download. So try again from the link in today's email and hopefully it works this time. All right, so to review, our approach to grass identification this week is to look for simple but distinct characteristics of both the leaves of the grasses and their inflorescences. And to review, an inflorescence is the flowering part or head of the grass. So let's review some of those terms just so we're all on the same page as we move forward today. So looking at the diagram on the right, we can see a sketch of a grass. The main stem of that grass is luckily for us called a stem. Another term that you might hear is a culm. So we have a stem or a culm. Along the stem, you can find leaves. And leaves are made up of a few different parts. First, we have the leaf blade. And the leaf blade is what we typically think of as a leaf. But where the leaf blade joins the stem, it actually wraps around the stem and forms a structure called the sheath. So this portion on the diagram is the sheath. Okay, where the sheath ends, there's a joint or a node. And this node is usually a swollen part that you can find on the stem. 
Okay. If you're able to find a node, then that means you are looking at a grass and you're not looking at another grass like plant, like a sedge or a rush. Okay, another term to point out is the collar region. And I've circled a collar region on this grass here. So this term is used to refer to um, the juncture of the leaf blade and the leaf sheath. Okay, and there are some really great characteristics that we can look for in the collar region to help tell our grasses apart. And we'll look at those shortly. Okay, so what does this look like on a real grass? Well, here we can see that we have our leaf blade and I've pulled that leaf blade back so we can see this is the sheath here where that leaf blade wraps around the stem. And then of course, this is our stem, okay? We can't see a node in this picture, but it's there at the bottom of this leaf sheath, okay? This area right here is called the collar region. Okay, going up to the top of this grass, the flowering head is of course called the inflorescence. And here, the stem turns into a structure called the rachis. So it's basically just the stem of the inflorescence. So if you don't want to remember the term rachis, that's okay. Um, but you may see that in some of your grass identification guides um, that you use as a reference, okay? The flowering unit of a grass is called a spikelet, okay? Um, this right here is a spikelet. This is where all of the flower parts are going to be contained, where the seeds are going to develop. There's a lot of um, specific terms, a lot of small microscopic pieces that go into a spikelet. We're not gonna get into that depth in this series. Um, so we're gonna keep it general and just refer to them as spikelets. And then if spikelets are on a stalk, we call that stalk a pedicel. Um, so right here, we would have a pedicel. Um, but typically I refer to as refer to it as a stalk, and you'll hear me say stalk throughout the presentation. So um, I try to keep it basic for us. But if you do see that term pedestal, it's referring to the stalk holding a spike clip. Okay, the next part of a grass we're gonna focus on is this portion right here. So we're gonna go back to this collar region and look at this structure. And that structure is called a ligule. And ligules come in many different forms. They're a structure that's found in that collar region where the leaf blade joins the stem, okay? Ligules can be hairy or they can be membranous, okay? Here we have some sketches and some pictures of hairy ligules. So this one right here, we have short bristly hairs. We can see those short bristly hairs here. We have long hairs in this ligule that we can see in this photo here. Other ligules can be membranous. So this looks like a piece of skin or a membrane. They can be short, like in this photo, or they can be really tall, like in this grass here, okay? Ligules that are membranous are typically white early in the season when the grass is young. But as the grass ages, um, they often turn yellow or brown. Um, so if it's not white, um, don't let that trip you up. They can be different colors, just kind of depends on when you see that grass, okay? Not all grasses have ligules. Some of them do not, okay? Noting if a grass has a ligule or not is an important thing to um, mark down when you're writing down characteristics of a grass to try to tell which one is which. Um, so in this case, we just have a raised smooth surface. There's no hairs, there's no membrane. Um, so that's like in this diagram, we don't have anything in that area. There's no ligule. Okay, two other characteristics that are much less common, but very helpful if you see them, um, are something called oracles and horns. So oracles we can see on the left, and they're an extension of the leaf blade that serve as um, arm-like structures that hug the stem. So here we can see our leaf blade ends and we have these extensions that look like arms. And in the photo, we can see one here and then two down here. And it's really clear when you pull this leaf blade back 
you'll be able to see those oracles open up like arms, like they're opening up from a hug, okay? Not very common on a lot of grasses in Illinois, um, but out west, there's a lot more grasses that have oracles. The other structure um, that we can look for in the collar region is something called a horn. And a horn is a stiff extension of the leaf sheath. So here it's a U-shaped leaf structure. And we can see it in this photo here. There's only one grass in Illinois that I have seen personally that has horns. That's not to say there isn't another one out there that I haven't encountered yet. Um, this one is Indian grass. We'll talk about it today. Um, has this very distinctive U-shaped projection of the leaf sheath. Um, and those are called horns. Okay, let's move on to looking at the different types of inflorescences. And there's a few questions that we can ask ourselves to tell the inflorescences apart. And um, we're gonna go through these. And if it doesn't make sense right now, as we go through the examples, hopefully we'll start to see um, some trends and, and pick up on the differences between these different types. So remember the inflorescence is the flowering head of the grass. And the first question we can ask ourselves is does the main axis or that rachis branch? If it does, we have a panicle, okay? This means that we have branches and then our spikelets can either be stalked or stalkless. So they can have a pedicel or they can not have a pedicel. Um, the sketch on the left is the most typical panicle arrangement that you will see. Um, but then this sketch on the right, we still have branches and then we have our spikelets directly attached to those branches. The other two types of inflorescences do not have a branched axis or rachis. They're unbranched. And here we can distinguish them um, by the spikelets being stalked or not being stalked. If the spikelets are on a stalk, we can call that a raceme. Okay? And there's kind of two forms of racemes. We can have the more traditional where we have our central unbranched rachis and small stalks supporting each of our spikelets, or we can have a collection of spikelets that is together held on a small stalk. Um, as I mentioned on Monday, some people will describe these arrangements as a more specific type of panicle. Um, it really is, however, it makes the most sense to you. For me, if I can say that I have a collection of spikelets that are on a stalk, it makes sense to put that in the raceme category, okay? And then our last type of inflorescence is a spike. This is the easiest one. We have just one central rachis and we have spikelets directly attached to that rachis, okay? Typically, I'll see if I have a spike or a panicle and if it's neither of those, then I'm gonna go with a raceme. What do these look like? Well, here are some pictures of these inflorescences on some real grasses. So in the left two panes, we have examples of panicles. In the middle two, we have racemes. And here, hopefully we can see we have a spikelet that's on a stalk and we have a collection of spikelets on a stalk. And then finally, on the right, we have two examples of spikes. So again, as we go through each of the examples of grasses, hopefully you'll pick up on um, those categorizations a little bit clearer. Okay, one characteristic we can look for on spikelets is something called an on. Ons are an extension of the edge of that spikelet, and they are there to help with seed dispersal and to you know, act as a um, deterrent to grazers that may come along. Um, and they can take many different shapes and forms. You can have more than one on on a spikelet. You can have short ons, long ons. Um, so here in the pictures, you can see three different examples of ons. So paying attention to the size of them, if they're present, how many are present on a spikelet, all of those characteristics are important to note. Okay, so with that short review, we're going to get started with today's prairie grasses. And we're gonna start by taking a step back 
um, to look at where we can find the prairies. Um, so prairies can be found across the middle portion of the United States, and there are three main classifications or types of prairies, short grass, mixed grass, and tall grass prairie. Um, they are aptly named by the height of the grasses that serve as the dominant cover in those prairies. So we in Illinois are in the tall grass prairie, so the dominant tall grass prairie species um, typically grow between five and eight feet tall. Um, in the picture on the right, you can see a little bit more of a detailed look at where the historic extent of the tall grass prairie was. And then in this photo, we can see by county in Illinois, the historic extent of prairie throughout the state. So this was as of 1820. Um, right now, less than one hundredth of a percent of the original 22 million acres of prairie in Illinois remains in a high quality state. So we do have a slightly higher percentage of prairie remaining, but it might be prairie restorations or degraded prairies, not necessarily intact high quality prairie. But we are known as the prairie state. So of course it's important to know um, what grasses we can find out in the prairie. And one of the really amazing ecological benefits of prairie plants is their extensive root system. Many of you are probably familiar with this diagram um, because it depicts the root systems of some common prairie plants, but I always like to include it because it's just astonishing to see what is happening below the ground. So I put a star above um, the grasses that they included in this diagram and their roots range from about two to 10 feet in depth. Um, so just wanted to throw that up um, for you to think about because, you know, we're talking about what we can see above ground, but there's a lot um, that is going down below the soil as well. So with that short background, we're going to go ahead and jump into um, learning how to identify and tell these different prairie grasses apart. So I think I have about 18 different species. Um, that we're going to cover today. So let's go ahead and dive right in and get started. Our first grass is side oats grama, Budalua curtipendula. And if you haven't tried saying that, Budalua is probably my favorite Latin genus to say. Um, this native grass can be found in upland prairies, glades, and bluffs. And it's one of four species in the Budalua genus that can be found in Illinois. We're going to look at another one on the next slide. This grass is relatively slender and thin, um, and it typically grows about two feet tall. Um, but down here in southern Illinois, where I'm located, I've seen it grow four to five feet tall. So depending on where you find it, um, it can definitely range in height. Um, early in the season, this grass has hairs on the margins or the edges of the leaf blades, and the hairs can be found on glands. So in this middle picture, hopefully we can see there are some sparse hairs along the edge of the leaf. And if you can see these tiny little white to yellow dots, those are glands. So the presence of glands um, underneath the hairs is something unique and something to note. And the presence of these hairs only on the edges of the leaves, not on top or bottom of the leaf blade, just on the edges, is really distinctive for this grass. Um, I didn't mention this earlier, but with a lot of these leaf characteristics like ligules, sometimes even the oracles, as the season progresses and these grasses have been outside exposed to the elements for months at a time, those hairs and those ligules can fade away and they can um, wither away. So early in the season um, is when these are more of a reliable characteristic to look for. So before Cytoat's grandma has its inflorescence, if I think that the grass I'm looking at is side oats. I'll look at the leaf blade. I'll look for those glands and those hairs coming off the edge of the leaf. The inflorescence that it has is a raceme and the rachis or that central stem of the inflorescence has a zigzag shape. And you can see that really clearly in this photo on the right. We can see the way that that rachis zigzags um, all the way up that inflorescence. 
The spikelets often will hang off the side of the rachis, and you can see that in the background in this photo here. So that inflorescence often will start to lean later in the season and the spikelets are held off on the side of the stem. Okay, we call this a raceme. So in this left picture, we can see we have that stalk and then we have a collection of spikelets. You can see that these spikelets do have ons. That's, I never need to get that specific with this one because it is so distinctive um, that I've never had to look and see, you know, compare if it has ons or doesn't have ons to tell that it's Zydote's grandma. So keep this one in your mind as we switch to blue grandma, another grandma grass, Budalua gracilis. This one is only found in a few scattered counties in Illinois. Uh, but it is a native found in sandy, less and gravel prairies. It is, again, a delicate short grass. And this time, this one only grows between 6 and 12 inches tall. It has a hairy ligule and some other hairs in that collar region. And the spikelets are arranged in racemes that resemble eyelashes. Um, in the picture on the right, it is flowering. And so these green um, structures that you see, these are the anthers or the male part of the grass flower that have been pushed out or exerted from the spikelets. Okay, so if you see a grass that looks like this, that means it's flowering. Okay. Um, it is possible to confuse this species with hairy grandma, which is um, closely related, also found in, in just a couple counties in Illinois, um, but it is true to its name, a lot hairier. So we see a few hairs on this blue grandma. There'd be a lot more hairs in this region and then even along um, the raceme in hairy grandma. Um, another way you can tell them apart is we see um, the anthers are like a yellow green and blue grandma and hairy grandma, they're red. Okay, so just a few ways to tell them apart because um, they look relatively similar. The next grass we're gonna look at is called Prairie Three On. And this is one grass um, that has a common name that has a helpful clue in it um, to help us identify this grass. So Prairie Three On or Aristida oligantha is a native grass found in drier areas, including prairies, glades, pastures, and railroads. And it is found in nearly every county in Illinois. It's much more common than I initially thought that it was. It is again, a rather thin grass and its nodes on the stem are usually red. It grows about two feet tall, and it's one of those grasses that doesn't have a ligule. So if you pulled that leaf blade back, you just see a smooth surface, but you wouldn't see an actual ligule. So this inflorescence has been described um, as a spike, as a raceme, and as a panicle. Um, so it really is up to you, um, whichever one makes the most sense. I used to call it a spike, but then I've been looking a little bit more closely, and I think I'm going to go with a raceme. So hopefully we can point out in this photo, we have a spikelet, it has its long ons, and it's on a short stalk. We can see it right here. We can see it right here. We can see it right here. To you, that might look like a branch, so you might say it's a panicle. Um, before the spikelets are held out from the stem, it might look like they're directly attached, like a spike. So I definitely go with raceme or panicle, um, but really, uh, as I've said, I've seen them both listed in guidebooks, so um, there isn't a definite answer to this one. And then it has those three very long ons per spikelet. And we can see those three ons in this picture on the right. And this spikelet isn't yet mature, but when it is, the ons will bend at about this part on the um, spikelet and they'll bend out. Okay, I didn't, wasn't able to grab a picture of that, um, but that is something to note that that is how they will look when they mature. Um, this grass is one of 10 species in this genus and collectively they're known as the three on grasses. So if they all have three ons, how do you tell them apart? Well, the ons vary in length, um, not necessarily all three of them are the same length. Um, there's another one that looks quite similar um, that's called, 
needle grass, but it's three ons coil together right here. We don't see that on this one, so we know we have prairie three on. Okay, our next grass is another one that has very long ons and the spikelets, porcupine grass or Hesperostypa spartia. This one is one of two in its genus in Illinois, and it's native found in prairies, savannas, and pastures. It grows about two and a half to three and a half feet tall, and it is a cool season grass, so that means it's going to mature and produce an inflorescence in late spring or early summer. This one grows in clumps, and it has a tall membranous ligule that is typically about four to six millimeters tall or about half an inch. Hopefully we can see that membranous ligule over here. Okay, oops, I'm clicking ahead. Um, the inflorescence is described as a nodding panicle of spikelets with ons that measure four and a half to seven and a half inches long. So the ons on these spikelets are quite, quite large. It can be distinguished from the other closely related species in Illinois, which is called needle and thread grass, um, by the length of the ons, um, because porcupine grass has longer ons, and then the height of the ligule, which is um, taller in porcupine grass. So we said it's about um, a half an inch tall. So if the ligule was only about a quarter inch tall, then it's likely that you're looking at needle and thread grass. The um, spikelets and the ons are really interesting in this species um, because as the ons dry, they um, coil. So you can see that this on, um, gotta get my mouse, this on is coiling. And the purpose of that is to drill this spikelet into the ground, essentially planting that seed. Okay, prairie cord grass or Spartina pectinata is the only species in its genus found in Illinois. And it is found in nearly every county in the state as well. Um, it can be found in wet prairies or marshes. Um, lately, I've been seeing it growing all over the roadsides. And um, this is one grass that has very, very, very sharp leaves. Um, speaking from experience, if you're not careful, it can very easily give you a paper cut. Um, so I try to point those out in the presentation so that um, you're a little more careful if you suspect that you're looking at prairie cord grass. Um, don't necessarily rub your hand along the leaf blades, but be a little bit gentler with that one. Um, hopefully you can see in the photo on the left um, that the leaf blades are relatively thin, but they're very long. So they gradually taper to a very thin point and the leaves just look very different from most of the other grasses um, that we're gonna look at because they just are so long and thin and taper to that point. They do have a prominent midrib and hopefully in that middle photo, um, let me get my pointer, you can see that midrib right here. And there is a ligule that's a fringe of hairs. It might look like a membrane on, in, in this picture, but it is a fringe of hairs that you'd be able to tell if you saw it in person. And then we would describe this inflorescence as a racine. Again, we have a collection of spikelets that is on a stalk. Here again, look, we can see that it's flowering. We have those anthers that have been exerted or pushed out of those spikelets, okay? And these racemes are um, between one and four inches long, so they're pretty large. Okay. Indian grass is one of those quintessential tall grass prairie species. Its Latin name is Sorgastrum newtons. And again, it's the only Sorgastrum species that we have in Illinois. Um, this native grass can be found in prairies, savannas, and glades in every county in Illinois. It is a very robust grass and it can grow up to seven feet tall. The color of this grass is really distinctive as it's very bluish green. So hopefully in the photo on the left, you can see how it's not that bright, brilliant green, um, but it is more of a blue hue. And if you see a bunch of this grass growing in a prairie, 
um, surrounded by that, that usual bright green, um, it stands out um, pretty, there's a pretty big contrast, excuse me, um, between this grass and the other grasses. Um, if you need some more characteristics, the leaves have a prominent white midrib. We can see it here. Um, there are velvety hairs on the nodes. I don't have a picture of those. Um, this grass is that one that has the horns in the collar region. So we've seen this picture before. We have those horns. It also has a membranous ligule right here between those horns. And then the inflorescence is a panicle of golden orange, silky textured on spikelets. This is one of my favorite grasses to just run my hand down the inflorescence uh, because it's very silky smooth. Um, it has that really distinctive golden orange color. In the middle picture, you can see that those anthers are bright yellow. So this grass has so many distinctive characteristics from the color to the horns, to the orange color of the spikelets that if you put a few of those together, you should be able to pick this one out every time. Um, right now down in Southern Illinois, at least, um, this is the grass that you can see just covering the median strips on the highways as you drive. And I think it's just very striking and beautiful. So I love driving and seeing um, the, the golden orange inflorescences waving in the wind. It's really, really beautiful grass. Okay, switchgrass is another iconic tall grass prairie species growing about six feet tall. Its Latin name is Panicum virgatum. So it's one of 13 panicums or panic grasses in Illinois. Now we talked about this on Monday. There's a different group of grasses also called the panic grasses. And we'll talk about one of those in the next slide. So this native is found in prairies, savannas and bluffs. It is a bunch grass. Um, and the leaves are going to curl distinctly when it's dried. So if I'm having a hard time um, telling this grass apart from others late in the season, um, so let's say we're almost into October. So in October, I'd go out and look for a, you know, six foot tall grass growing in a really tight bunch whose leaves are really tightly curled um, as they've dried. And that would give me a lot of clues that I'm looking at switchgrass. Okay, but while it's actively growing, um, you can look for a prominent midrib on the leaves. We can see that one here. And then my favorite character, characteristic, excuse me, to look for is the hairy ligule that extends beyond just having hairs in the ligule. It forms a really dense triangle of long white hairs. And I'm gonna outline it here. It's hard to tell in this photo. Um, but early in the growing season, this grass has a triangle shape um, gathering of these long white hairs. No other prairie grass that I know of um, has that characteristic, so that's kind of my telltale sign for switchgrass. The inflorescence is a broad spreading panicle. The panicle itself is typically one to one and a half feet tall, so it's pretty large. Um, and the spikelets are reddish in color. You may have heard about switchgrass um, in the news as a grass that's being researched and used as a biofuel. So if this name sounds familiar, that could be where you've heard it before. Okay, our next grass is deer tongue grass or Dicanthelium clandestinum. And we talked about two other Dicanthelium species on Monday in our woodland grass section. And we talked about how dicanthelliums are also referred to as panic grasses. And they used to be in the panicum genus, but then they were split out. Um, so there are 33 species of dicanthelliums in Illinois. Um, I'm going to be honest with you, a lot of them are really tough to tell apart, uh, but I tried to pick a few that are relatively easy and distinctive. Um, so this one, deer tongue grass, is a native found in sandy woods, savannas, and prairies. It has long, stiff hairs, and you can find these hairs along the stem and along the leaf sheaths. Now, the hairs aren't always on the stem. I've found in certain resources, they say that the hairs are on the stem, others say that they aren't. So I'm going to take it as sometimes the hairs can be on the stem and sometimes they aren't. Um, but they're always going to be on that leaf sheath. So in this photo here, um, this is a leaf sheath 
that has those really stiff bristly hairs, right underneath it, that's a stem and it has those hairs on it. But if we look at this picture on the left, this is a stem and it doesn't have those hairs. So in general, look in both places, um, but as long as they're on the sheath, that's gonna be our first clue. We're gonna look for the type of leaf that we have. We have these really broad leaves and we can describe the base of the leaf as clasping the stem. So we can see here that that leaf blade wraps around almost completely and, and clasps the stem, okay? They also taper to a narrow point at the tip. We're not gonna find any hairs on the nodes of this grass, okay? So we have smooth nodes. And then our inflorescence is a panicle. That panicle inflorescence with those rather round um, spikelets is characteristic of the dicanthelions. And the dicanthelions are also interesting because they bloom twice in the season. Um, so they're going to bloom early in, you know, late spring, early summer. They're going to have a terminal panicle. So that means they're going to put up this rachis at the tip, at the tip top of the plant and have that first inflorescence. And then later in the season, they're going to put out like these side shoots of other panicles that are going to come out from the axles of the leaves. So you'll see the panicle at the tip of the plant that's, you know, senesced or it's withered away. It's probably missing a lot of its spikelets. And then you'll find in the offshoot um, smaller panicles that are developing later in the season. Um, deer tongue grass does look similar to another panic grass, um, but this one continues to grow throughout the season. So the leafy parts of the plant are going to continue to grow after it puts out its initial panicle, which is not typical, and it will reach about three to four feet in height by the end of the season. So this one is rather robust compared to some of the other dicanthelium species that tend to only get, you know, between one to two feet tall. Okay, our next grass is barnyard grass called Echinocloa muricata. And it's a native that can be found in wetter, more disturbed areas. And I hesitated on where to put this grass in our, our grass ID presentation um, because it easily could have gone into the nuisance grass presentation on Friday. Um, so if you're looking at it and saying, oh, that's a weed, it should be in Friday's presentation. I somewhat agree with you, um, but I kept it here um, because it's often been planted as a food source for ducks and I see it in prairie restorations all the time and personally haven't seen it take over and become a problem. That's not to say that that's not the case for you, um, but we're just gonna talk about it today. Um, so native found in wet disturbed areas. This is that grass that we've seen this picture where it doesn't have a ligule, okay? So that's a great telltale sign. The leaves have a prominent midrib and then the inflorescence is described as a panicle and the spikelets can be either on or onless. So there are actually three different varieties of this species and you can tell them apart based on the presence or absence of ons and then the relative hairiness um, of the inflorescence. I'm not gonna get into that detail, but I just wanted to show you um, an example in the middle picture. These spikelets do not have ons. Um, what you see here, these are just some hairs. Those aren't ons. And then in this right picture, we can see the spikelets do have ons. Um, so it's the same species, just two different varieties of it, um, but don't let that confuse you. Um, this may be one that you might want to describe as a raceme. And I would say that sounds good to me too. Um, the general form of it does look very panicle like. Um, so again, you can see sometimes it's really hard to tell the difference in what type of inflorescence you're looking at. Um, but as long as you're able to find a way that makes sense to you, um, for me personally, I found that that generally works okay. All right, this one might sound familiar, little blue stem, Schizacrium scoparium is our next grass. And it's a very popular prairie grass found in nearly every county in Illinois. 
This native can be found in prairies, bluffs, savannas, and glades. It is more of a thin, delicate bunch grass that grows two to three feet tall. And um, considering that thinner, more delicate growth form can help distinguish it from broom sedge, which looks very similar, but is much more robust. And we're gonna compare it to broom sedge on the next slide. The stems of little blue stem are often flattened and reddish in color. And hopefully on the picture on the right, you can see um, some of those stems are red. If you see part of the stem that's green, oftentimes that's that leaf sheath, right? That wraps around the stem. Um, so it looks like the stem is green, but it's actually usually mostly red. The leaves are rather thin and pretty sparse along the branches. It does have a short membranous ligule. And then the inflorescence is described as a racine and has fluffy white spikelets that look like eyelashes. And they're pretty small, um, which we're gonna use to compare with the broom sedge as well, okay? So in general, I, I think of little blue stem as more of a, a delicate, thinner, red stemmed grass. And we're gonna compare that now with broom sedge. So right away, you might say, hmm, that looks really similar. Um, and why is it called broom sedge? Is it a sedge or is it a grass? Well, it's a grass. Um, unfortunately, this common name is misleading. So broom sedge is not a sedge, it's a grass. Andropogon virginicus. And it is native and can be found in prairies, savannas, pastures, and disturbed areas. It can grow between one and a half to three feet tall. But just the other day, I saw some that were five feet tall, five and a half feet tall. Um, and in general, it can tolerate poorer site conditions than little blue stem. So if you're seeing it on roadsides, in old pastures, um, in more disturbed areas, just based on where it's growing, I'd already start leaning you towards broom sedge versus little blue stem. Um, it is a bushy bunch grass that turns golden orange in the fall. So rather than being reddish, it typically is more orange to golden color. And it's just more robust and leafier. I know that's not a technical term, but it's just much leafier than little blue stem. And you can hopefully see in the picture on the right, this is a bunch of broom sedge growing and there's just a lot of leaves, way more leaves than you would find along a stem of little blue stem. Um, it also has flattened stems than, um, just like, excuse me, just like little blue stem and has hairs at the base of the leaves in the collar region and also has a membranous ligule. So unfortunately, you're not gonna be able to use um, flat stems or membranous ligule to tell those two grasses apart because they both have those characteristics. It also has racemes of fluffy feathery spikelets, uh, but typically they're the hairs, those fluffy white hairs are longer in broom sedge and the collection of spikelets is bigger. But again, unless you're able to hold them side by side and see that comparison up close, um, it's a little hard to tell. So I generally will look at the robustness of the grass, how leafy it is and where it's growing to tell these two apart. Okay, big blue stem, Andropogon gerardii, is um, note that it's more closely related to broom sedge than little blue stem. Big blue stem and broom sedge are in the same genus and they're in a different genus than little blue stem. So don't let those common names fool you. Um, but big blue stem is native to Illinois. It is actually our state grass. So if you didn't know, uh, we do have a state grass and it is big blue stem. This one is also commonly called turkey foot. And you can see that because of the shape of the inflorescence. Um, it can be found in prairies, savannas, and glades in every county in Illinois. And typically when you say prairie, uh, big blue stem is the grass that comes to people's minds. They might not know what it's called, but this is kind of the picture of the grass um, that people think of when they think of a prairie. This one can grow up to eight feet tall. Just like broom sedge and little blue, its stems are often flattened and reddish in color. So in the middle picture, we can see the stem here is red. And then we've got a few overlapping leaves here. These are the sheaths that are green. Um, the leaf sheath and the base of the blade can have some sparse hairs and there is a membranous ligule. In this one, it's late in the season, so that membranous ligule is brownish in color. 
That inflorescence is described as a raceme um, or our turkey foot. Um, and another related species that you may find is called stand blue stem, but it's only known, I believe, in one county in Illinois. So it's much, much rarer and restricted. Um, so if you're looking at something with a turkey foot shaped inflorescence, it's likely that you're looking at big blue stem. Okay, June grass, Calaria macrantha, um, is the only species in its genus in Illinois, native and found in prairie savannas and limestone glades. It's a cool season bunch grass, and it typically only grows between six and 18 inches tall. So because it's that cool season grass, it's gonna develop its inflorescence early in the season. We can see that in the middle picture, and then it's gonna dry up in the summer. And this in the left photo is what it's gonna look like in the summer. The leaves have a prow shaped tip. So think about the shape of the tip of a boat and that's what the tip of that leaf is going to look like. So it's going to be joined at the tip forming like a curved tip of a canoe shape um, rather than flat. And the leaves, both the blades and the sheaths have short fuzzy hairs on them. So hopefully you can see those in the picture on the right. It also has a white membranous ligule and the inflorescence is a dense panicle with spikelets that are longer than they are wide. So in the middle photo, you can tell that that's a panicle, but when it's dried, um, like in the picture on the left, it really looks like a spike. So if you don't catch it at the right time of year, that description might um, confuse you a little bit, um, but it is a panicle. It just, um, the branches are really oppressed when it dries. All right, moving on, next we have purple top or Tridens flavus, native grass found in savannas, fields, and woodland borders. Lately, I have seen it growing on the roadside um, very prevalently down in Southern Illinois, um, but it can be found in nearly every county in our state. So this grass is gonna grow between three and five feet tall, and it has dense velvety hairs on the nodes, which you may be able to see some of those hairs in this picture. Okay, dense velvety nodes. And then they're also present on the outside of the collar. So we could describe this as being on the back side of the juncture of the leaf blade and the sheath. So if we took this picture and we held that leaf blade up and looked right here in the back where that leaf blade becomes the sheath, not on the inside, but on the outside, we'd have velvety hairs. You can kind of see some of them in this picture here. So that's a spot we have not looked at before as a place to look for a characteristic. So that one's a little bit unique that it has those velvety hairs um, on that underside of the leaf blade. It has a panicle inflorescence. It's very open and airy. And in the photo in the center, that's very characteristic how those branches droop. Um, so that central rachis, look, that's held straight up, but the branches are all drooping. Um, that's very characteristic of purple top. Um, the spikelets are purple and oily. At this time of the year, they look really black, um, but they're a dark, dark purple and really oily. So if you run the panicle through your hand, it leaves behind a greasy substance. Um, so it does have another common name that is grease grass. So if you've heard of grease grass before, it's also called purple top. I haven't been able to find the reason um, that it produces that oily substance. My guess would be it's a deterrent to um, something that would want to come along and eat those seeds. Um, there is another species in this genus in Illinois, but its panicle is more spike-like. Um, so this open, airy, drooping, drooping branched panicle is characteristic of purple top. All right, prairie drop seed Spirobolus heterolepsis is one of nine species in its genus in Illinois. It's a native found in prairies and limestone glades. And it is a warm season bunch grass with dense tufts of really narrow leaves um, seen in the top right photo. So remember that prairie cord grass had really narrow leaves. Um, prairie drop seed does as well, but they're much smaller, much thinner, and drop, prairie drop seed is a bunch grass, whereas cord grass was not. Um, this grass tends to grow about one to two feet tall. The leaves have short hairs in the collar region as well as a fringed membrane. And the panicle is, the inflorescence is a panicle, excuse me, but it is more contracted and narrow than other panicles that we've looked at. 
Um, you may have heard of this grass because it is growing in popularity um, as a landscape um, grass because of those dense bunches. Um, and it has like a goldeny orange appearance in the fall. It's really striking. I've been looking at it and, and waiting to incorporate it into my home garden as well. So um, really, really um, striking looking grass. All right, we are getting down to the last few for our days. So next up is purple love grass, Aerograstus spectabilis, one of 15 species of Aerograstus grasses in Illinois. It's native and found in prairies, savannas, and disturbed sandy areas. It's a bunch grass and it's only about one to two feet tall. And of that height, the inflorescence is typically over a foot tall. So over half of the height of this grass is gonna be taken up by that inflorescence. It has a ligule of long white hairs, and then that large open panicle has these purple elongated spikelets. And if you look closely in the photo on the right, you can see that that spikelet is made up of what looks like overlapping scales that are stacked on top of each other. Um, remember, we're keeping it simple, so we're not talking about what each of those individual scales is called. They're actually called lemmas, but again, you don't need to remember that. Um, but that stacking appearance is a little bit different than other spikelets that we've seen. Another name for this grass is tumble grass because the inflorescence when it's mature has been known to break off and tumble away, which helps spread the seeds. All right, gamma grass, Tripsacum dactyloides, um, is what I think is one of the most underappreciated prairie grasses that we have. It's a striking, um, very robust grass, grows about three to seven feet tall, and can be found in moist areas, prairies, and savannas. It is a bunch grass, and it has an interesting growth habit, and I'm going to cover up our range map for a second and show you the way that that grass grows. Um, it forms these dense bunches where the leaves are held very strongly away from the center of the bunch. So it looks like a deer came embedded in the center of these bunches of grass. And that's how big the bunches are as well. The first time I saw it, I thought we had a family of deer that was hanging out in this spot. And then I learned, nope, that's just how that grass grows. So really interesting growth form. This is another one of those grasses that has very, very sharp leaves um, that will very easily cut you if you're not careful handling them. They have a really prominent white midrib that you can see in the photo on the left. And then the, the inflorescence, excuse me, is a raceme, and it's a very large raceme, four to 12 inches long. And the racemes are held in the same arrangement as big blue step. It's kind of turkey foot shaped. And the first time I saw this inflorescence, I thought I had found a very strange um, large version of big blue stem, but then learned it's a completely different plant. Um, the flowers in this inflorescence are monoecious. So this means that there are separate male and female flowers on the same plant. So in the middle picture at the base of the raceme, are the female flowers. So that means that in the spikelets at the bottom of the raceme, it has the female flower parts. So these parts right here that are sticking out are called stigmas, okay? And then the top three quarters of those racemes have spikelets that have the male floral parts inside. So these are the anthers that have been exerted or pushed out of those spikelets. So really interesting, um, grass, if you're able to see it when it's flowering, it's just beautiful. Put that picture up. Okay, our last grass for today is Canada wild rye, Elemis canadensis. We learned two other rye grasses on Monday, and this is our third. Uh, this native can be found in every county in Illinois, in prairies, savannas, and woodland edges. Like the other ryes, it has pretty unremarkable leaves. They're wide, weak, shiny, dark green, doesn't really give you much information to work on. Um, what really helps me is looking at the inflorescence. So the inflorescence is a spike. And in Canada wild rye, it's always going to droop. So in some of the other ones we looked at, sometimes it's held straight up, sometimes it droops. In Canada wild rye, it's always going to droop. And then the awns that are present as the grass matures, they're going to curve backwards. 
So in the picture on the right, you can see that those ons are held straight. So I wouldn't necessarily be able to tell at this time which type of ryegrass I'm looking at. But as they mature, you can see in these other photos that those ons very strongly curve backwards. And that is the clue that tells me that I'm looking at Canada wild rye. All right, we made it through the prairie grasses today. So up next on Friday is our nuisance grass identification. We're gonna start at 10 a.m. like we have been all week. And just because something is categorized as a nuisance grass, we're gonna cover some native species, some non-native species, and some invasive species. We'll talk about what those terms mean, why we stuck them all in as nuisance grasses. Um, and we've got quite a few species to cover, so I encourage you to join us again on Friday. Um, so at this point, um, I know we're, we're nearing 11 and I'm happy to stay on a little bit past that time to answer any questions that we have from the chat box. But I wanna thank all of you for joining us today. Um, it was great to see so many people joining us for our second day. So Nancy, I'm gonna go ahead and um, see if you've got any questions. All right, well, first of all, thank you, Erin. A lot of positive comments in the chat and we just had a few questions today. So um, a couple comments too. Carolyn said a quack grass has excellent clasping oracles. Teddy yes. asked, how do you tell the difference between a pedicel and a raceme and a branch and a rachis? So that's a great question. And <laughs> in some of the grasses today, um, it's difficult to tell. And I don't have a clear answer. Um, you know, like I've said before, some guides that I'll look at will categorize something as a panicle. So then you would say that it's a branch and others will categorize the same grass as a raceme. So then it would be a pedicel. Um, so yeah, there isn't necessarily a clear answer, unfortunately. The potato potato controversy. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> um, okay, uh, next question was from Janine and it was more of a comment. Um, she said that Blue Grandma is considered endangered in Illinois. And if anybody finds it, please report it to the Natural, Natural Heritage Database, which I included the link to that Wonderful. in the chat box earlier. Great. Uh, Eliz Elizabeth asks, do hairs have a purpose? Um, so there are some potential um, purposes for hairs. So um, mostly as a deterrent to anything that would come along and try to eat that grass. Okay, um, great. Yeah, a lot of the times, especially if they're bristly hairs, um, sometimes it can help, you know, with, um, you know, like regulation of, um, excuse me, like temperature control too, to keep the grass warmer if it comes up really early in the season. But in general, I would say deterrent from, from being eaten. Okay, great. Just a few more. Um, Mary asks, is barnyard grass used as a cover crop? Um, I wouldn't necessarily be able to answer for sure if it's used as a cover crop. I know it's planted widely as a food source for um, waterfowl. Okay, great. And uh, Karen asked about cool season grasses. Do they bloom early or late? Cool season is going to bloom early. Warm season are going to bloom in the summertime. Okay, great. And is a uh, June grass good for pollinators? Hmm. I am not sure. If you want to look up the um, insect associations, I would recommend looking at the Illinois wildflowers page and then just type in in June grass. And if there is anything that's been researched or observed, it would be on there. That is great. And then uh, just a comment. Uh, Trident's Flavins has a strong melon rind smell at the base of the plant. Mmm, good. Ooh, I'll have to test that. Yes, yes. I'm and, always looking and, for new clues, so that's great. <laughs> yes, and then uh, Carrie uh, made a comment, um, and this is a uh, one I um, get a lot of comments on with prairie drop seed as far as fragrance. Um, some people, uh, as Carrie said, she feels it smells like cilantro. Um, I've had people reporting it smells like buttered popcorn or dirty socks. So I guess oh the smell is in the 
is in the personal belief. Interesting. Now I'm going to have to go and do a smell test on all these grasses. I love these clues. That's great. Exactly. <laughs> and, and those are all the questions we have today, Erin. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Nancy. And thank you everyone for joining us. Um, like I said, we hope to see you again on Friday at 10 a.m. for Nuisance Grasses. Thank you, everyone. Bye now. <laughs>